So thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for inviting me here to speak. I'm going to talk about liver transplantation today. So it's a fairly narrow um, environment. I am a total enthusiast when it comes to the liver, whether it's liver failure, whether it's liver transplantation, whether it's septic liver dysfunction. So that is my only disclosure. So one of the first decisions is who are you going to transplant? And how are you going to rationalize your decisions in regard of waiting list? For most of us, we say we've got acute liver failure, and we have a set of criteria for that. And we've got cirrhosis, which incorporates acute on chronic liver failure. And we've got a set of criteria for that. And it's two separate waiting lists. Your chances of getting transplanted as an acute liver failure are considerably higher than with cirrhosis or acute on chronic liver failure, where the death on waiting list is significant. The criteria are reasonable, and I'm going to talk through those in the next few slides. So that's really where we are. One should not transplant people with a meld of less than 15, because your risk of death during the transplant period is then greater than your survival over the next 12 months. So you've got to be cautious not to list people too early and the risks of transplantation. Now, acute liver failure used to be quite a clear-cut group. We had reasonable prognostic criteria to decide who to transplant, and those patients got listed, and there was a fair chance of transplantation. What is clear now is that the su survival without transplantation is improving, and therefore our ability to make clear decisions about who to transplant is getting fuzzy. And indeed, the other complicating issue is some of the liver support systems that we use, specifically plasma exchange, confounds all of your decision making in terms of prognosis. So this is getting more complex. By contrast, acute on chronic liver failure, that sudden deterioration in someone with cirrhosis, with deterioration in both their liver function and their extrahepatic organ function, is becoming a growing criteria. We're not so clear as to where we go on those transplant criteria, but if you look at the, this data here, your chances of survival if you've got three organ failure in terms of cirrhosis is really not great. This is the adapted score from SOFA in terms of the Cliff Consortium. Scores here, once your criteria are going up, your chances of survival are going down. For every unit, it is subtly different. Our survival for three organ failure is about 30% to discharge. Other centers, less. And this study, which is in press at the present time, from the American databases is really quite salient. It shows that one's survival for acute liver failure on a waiting list without transplantation is actually better now than for someone with acute on chronic liver failure. And that is raising quite considerable decision making is should we be prioritizing some of our acute on chronic liver failures to the same level as our acute and our hyperacute liver failures. We haven't got the answers yet, and I don't think it's quite clear, but these are the situations that we are going to have to address over the next while. And if you look at it here in terms of graphical form, again, you can see quite clearly that the death on waiting list for acute on chronic liver failure is, if anything now, significantly worse than for acute liver failure. And if you transplant these patients, interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, they're very similar at the beginning, then the acute liver failures plateau off post-transplant, where the acute on chronic liver failure mortality continues. That is probably related to comorbidity. And I'll speak for a few more in a couple more slides about the risk of age, particularly in terms of liver transplantation. And that is really emphasized here in Dean Carvelis's work from Edmonton, where he looked at acute on chronic liver failure in the ITU setting and your chances of getting a transplant. And what he demonstrated is that those with a delta increase in their SOFA score are much less likely to get to transplantation, as seen graphically here. 
What is, I think, really salient from this data is the importance of age. So your chances of survival, if you are greater than 60, really starts going down. That physiological reserve really begins to impact. Interestingly, that also shows for acute liver failure. This is old data now from my colleague, Will Vernal, but again, you see that age cutoff of 45 for acute liver failure transplants really significant. The other parameters being the quality of the graft that we'll speak to, the fact whether you're on vasopressors or not, or indeed your graft type, whether it's a good graft or a fatty graft or a split graft. So moving on to the decision to transplant being made, we really do need to address the quality of the graft that we're going to implant. And until recently, if you had a fatty liver, that was really poor, you were going to have a stormy post-operative recovery. Equally, if you're having a split liver graft, that's difficult. Living-related transplant has revolutionized liver transplantation. But in that, we must not forget that there is a healthy donor whom we are committing to an operation that does carry both a morbidity and a mortality. And the mortality rates are probably not reported in the literature to the level that they should be. But just for lung transplantation, liver transplantation, ex vivo liver perfusion, is a phenomenal environment where we can perfuse livers. There is competition at the moment between normothermic perfusion and hypothermic perfusion. Both of them allow you to perfuse livers for 12 to 24 hours. And what appears to be the data that's coming out is that those grafts improve while being perfused. So that you can look at their lactate consumption, their lactate um, excretion and metabolism, and actually assess when to transplant the liver. And that really is changing our view of poor liver transplants, particularly the fatty livers, where you can perfuse them and then look at them afterwards. The other thing that one must consider in managing liver transplantation is whether the patient you are transplanting, you are clear what is causing their organ dysfunctions. So is there renal failure, true hepatorenal failure, or is it chronic kidney disease? Both are equally prevalent. If anything, chronic kidney disease is more prevalent. How malnourished are they? What is their frailty index? Talked about age. What's their cardiac disease and comorbidity? Have they got alcoholic hepatitis? Once you've been in ITU and on steroids for alcoholic hepatitis, although you do well post-transplant compared to non-transplant management, your risk of CMV, HSV and the like is considerable. And is their encephalopathy reversible? Is it true hepatic encephalopathy or is it small vessel disease? All of these are highly pertinent. What has, without question, been shown to be of benefit in lots of case series is that the care of the transplantation patient is optimized by good teams. Teams who know each other and communicate well. You have got to have really clear pre-assessment protocols where surgery, hepatology, anesthesia, and critical care, along with our allied health professionals and nursing colleagues, are truly embedded together as one team. When a patient comes out of theater, returning to your ITU, you've got to have very clear handovers and handoffs between nursing and ODPs, anesthesia and surgery, and certainly, I will always ensure that I get a handover from both the surgeon and the anaesthetist. It is fascinating how often you get a different story. Subtly different. Surgery say, I need ultrasounds. Anaesthesia say, that was a dodgy hepatic artery. You definitely need ultrasounds on a daily basis. So getting that subtlety of information is really important. And you must be clear what your immunosuppression protocol is, ideally before transplantation. So just in very simple terms, what are you going to do when someone comes back from theatre? You're going to talk to everyone. You're going to get a further baseline evaluation. You've got to be clear on the vascular anatomy that the surgeons have undertaken and their course and metabolic status in the OR. If you're doing living related, I view the donor as, it's colloquial English, spun sugar. 
They are incredibly delicate. They are incredibly precious. And they get a very tight control from the intensive care team. Pain is a real issue in managing those patients. For the recipient, decisions about immunosuppression, which we'll talk to in a few slides, the clinical assessment, avoid coagulation support, that is one of your prime drivers for assessing graft function. So if you're going to give anything, platelets to keep the platelet count above 50, but not fresh frozen plasma or other products. And extubate when ready, when they're warm, when they're communicative. Some centres will extubate on table. It depends on your donor and your recipient. The things that you need to think about on return to um, the department are what is the graft function or dysfunction that you're looking for. Primary graft non-function is vanishingly rare. Dysfunction is a moderately common undertaking with a transaminitis of greater than 1,000, but is increasingly rare with good donor care, with good recipient care, and with the ex vivo liver perfusion systems. Small for size now, again, very rare. We've got it really well-tuned in terms of living-related donation. Non-occlusive graft infarction, again, it's rare, but you've got to think about it. At day 10, you get a transaminitis. It's not rejection. You do a CT angiogram. The vasculature is patent, but the liver is dying, and that group of patients need retransplantation. Acute rejection, it's relatively common, particularly in fit, healthy clinical courses. So when you've got someone with progress ongoing multiple organ failure, they won't reject until day 10 or day 14. For a routine transplant, they will reject at day five. And transported lymphocyte syndrome, you've got to think about when you're going cross-blood group. If you're getting any evidence for transaminitis with a drop in hemoglobin and you've gone across blood group, think about transplanted, uh, transported um, lymphocyte syndrome. And of course, the vascular issues, the biliary leaks and other organ dysfunction. Cardiovascular management is just like any other patient. They are not special. You just don't want the venous pressure too high. Norepinephrine is our specific drug of choice. The specific issues one needs to consider, pulmonary hypertension. You should have pre-diagnosed it, but occasionally it's a surprise in theater. And hepatopulmonary syndrome, consistent hypoxia. Occasionally we have ended up on ECMO post-transplant to protect the patient and the graft. This is the sort of imaging you get in pulmonary hypertension. So the graft assessment in the ITU setting, it's very basic. You're looking at delta lactate, you're looking at transaminases, the INR falling, the bilirubin, which nearly inevitably goes up initially and then comes down again, clinical review, ultrasound we would do on day one and day five, and CT scanning if ultrasound cannot visualize the hepatic artery. I track the full blood count and differential quite uh, con conscientiously, and I'll show you data as to why that's the case. Things like ICG and methacetin clearance, we really don't use anymore. Antibiotics, 48 hours for the routine cases, five days for complex cases, and antifungals only for the complex cases. The others, again, very standard. DVT prophylaxis, usually on return to theatre for the prothrombotic patients, as shown on TEG, and at day one for those that are not prothrombotic. The immunosuppression, the liver is great, it is incredibly immune tolerant, and therefore a low dose tacrolimus or advogarov regime with low dose steroids. We use IL-2 blockers in those with renal failure and mycophenolate or similar only outside the ITU environment. We do track eosinophils and the data for that is quite interesting. Um, but certainly if you get an AST going up at any time, you've got to think what is wrong with this liver. The standard rule of choice is the AST should be halving every day. If it goes up, you've either got rejection You've got sepsis, you've got a vascular problem with your hepatic artery or your portal vein. You might have a compression syndrome with segmental infarction, or as I spoke earlier, you might have vascular thrombotic, um, non-thrombotic graft infarction. 
High dose vasopressors, you can get areas of attenuation and graft dysfunction. Acute rejection often needs biopsy. You see that wonderful pattern of eosinophils and endothelitis. And this is nearly always associated with an eosinophilia, which usually predates the rise in transaminitis. And that is shown on this paper here, and there are other similar papers. And time precludes going in detail, but you can see this progressive transaminitis. And I certainly use that to separate, is this sepsis, is this rejection, am I going to biopsy? And in a patient where their coagulation means that I can't biopsy easily, if you've got eosinophilia, the odds are it's rejection. If you've got eosinopenia, the odds are it's sepsis. It's a really easy bedside test. Hyponatremia pre-transplant really does increase your morbidity. It increases your risk of delirium, it increases your risk of rejection, of pneumonia, and increases your clinical course. So try and get those sodiums corrected prior to transplantation, and don't allow them to go up too fast peritransplant. The neurological issues, ongoing encephalopathy, delirium, seizures, press is really quite prevalent post-transplant, and of course, coexisting um, ongoing small vessel disease. Concurrent infections such as aspergillomas are seen, particularly in patients who've been under the ITU for a long time or have been on steroids such as alcoholic hepatitis, and this is one such patient. I'm aware of time, so I will crack on. Infections really like any immunocompromised patient. This is an old slide, and I put it in just to say that it is fantastic that hepatitis and hepatitis C and B no longer exist as a problem post-transplant. To me, that is a revelation. The issues, quite apart from your fungal infections, your nocardia, your aspergillia, are the fact that most liver patients are colonized with multidrug resistant bacteria. So you've got to get your antimicrobials proper. If you have someone who develops thrombocytopenia, think HITS, if they've got a fat tag, it probably is HITS. Think also hemophagocytic syndrome, also common in the post-transplant setting. Those patients who are on high vasopressors or have had DCD grafts, they are likely to get hepatic artery ischemia in the significantly longer post-operative time course, usually around three months onwards. This ischemic cholangiopathy is significant and you get associated bile lakes. If it's early, less than three weeks, you transplant again. If it's late, you have to manage conservatively or with elective listing. Skip that for the sake of time. But just to say that the management of the transplant patient is a team effort. And it's fantastic to be part of that team and see how it's evolved over time to the point now that we also use ECMO in managing people, both pre- and peri-transplantation. Thank you for your attention.